2013 was an interesting time for Nick.com. With Working Man leading the charge, many different games were coming out for a variety of Nicktoons. This year, they took over the popular Super Brawl series after MP Game Studio went defunct but they continued to make a variety of regular Spongebob games as well. In January, they released the Karate Squid, based on the episode Squid Defense. In it, you control Squidward and have to karate chop as many items that come toward you as you can. You move him across this counter and rapidly chop at anything that comes your way. It takes a lot of button mashing. Be ready to annihilate your mouse. But once you garner enough points, you reach a chopping frenzy and have to smash a few stronger items until they break. You have to break a certain amount to move on to the next stage. But as you break an item, you fill your rage gauge, which is constantly going down, so you have to keep chopping to keep it up. Once you fill it, you can get more points for your chops, destroy things in frenzy mode with one hit, and kill clams that normally hurt you. Squidward must have learned that from Spongebob. This can be a good time killer. It's nice to just move along and destroy things. Causing destruction is such a satisfying experience. But while this game is simple, Workin' Man also released a few big ones this year. The same month, they gave us Return to Monster Island, a sequel to the reclaimed Monster Island game. In this, Spongebob has to find his friends on Monster Island, which is a big tourist attraction now. It's in a top-down format similar to Lava King, and you have to travel through stages and fight different monsters. You even control bigger monsters with a staff given to you by Dusty, a squirrel from a village of squirrels that look like Sandy. One of them makes a Skyrim reference. Such a sign of the times. When I last reviewed this, I said I couldn't find the keyboard key to use the staff, so I had to click its icon to use it instead. Well, as it so happens, it's the Z key. I'm sure I would have tried that one, so maybe I didn't press it hard enough and just assumed it didn't work. Oh well. But this game is really fun, and there's so much you can do in it. You have to appreciate the amount of details that went into every stage. Though I also found it to be extremely glitchy, which can be an issue in some cases because of the save system. You might end up cornering yourself in a glitch. Aside from that, this is really good. Working Man would make another sizable game in March, but it was a little different. Okay, it was extremely different. Super Easy Fun Time Adventure Pants is technically a crossover, but it's a Spongebob game more than anything else, so I'll still cover it here. This starts out as a simple platformer that seems straightforward enough. What could possibly go wrong with... Oh. 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 I see what we're dealing with. This is a rage game where the stage changes itself and characters from different Nicktoons block your field of vision. It's based on Shobo No Action, aka Cat Mario. And fun fact, Sanjay and Craig are in this even though their show hadn't aired yet. But with these stages constantly shifting and the characters preventing you from seeing anything, it's a lot harder to reach the exit ladder than you might think it is. At the same time, while this is supposed to be a rage game, I didn't find myself getting too frustrated with it. I mostly just laughed. While other rage games like Bodocross could be genuinely frustrating, I just found this one fascinating. I think it's because of how over the top it is. How can you get angry at something this silly? Still, I can't play it for too long if I value my sense of well-being. Though I will tell you how it ends, because it's hilarious. Spongebob climbs the ladder, but then he falls and you're met with an April Fool's joke. Hey, workin' man, you made this in March. It's a little early for that. But then you can click and drag this Krabby Patty to Spongebob, and then you really win. Hooray! The game also counts how many times you die, just to remind you how bad you're doing. It makes you feel especially bad when you die to an easily avoidable obstacle. How dare they immortalize that mistake. But regardless of the rage factor, I like this one, and the stages are fun to navigate once you figure out what to do. Again, for a rage game, it isn't too rage-inducing but it sure makes for a good time. Now before we move on to April, I want to make a quick mention of a game I missed in my 2012 video. It isn't anything too special, just thought I'd bring it up. This is Secondhand Swag, one of the trophy games Working Man made to go with ones like Pile the Prize and Colossal Chaos. You control Patrick and catch SpongeBob's trophies as he throws them. Then you bring them to a wheelbarrow. You can even stack a few. It's okay. Eventually, I'll make a video to cover all the ones I missed along with the ones with unknown release dates, but let's just pretend I mentioned this one last time. Moving on. So April gave us a cute two-player game called SpongeBob Squared Multiplayer. Thankfully, you don't actually have to wait for another player to join. You can just face off against the computer. As SpongeBob, you designate a line on a grid while Patrick does the same thing. You slowly form squares, and the first person to complete a square earns a point. You can even make squares around stars for bonus points. It's really fun, but it can be really challenging. Your opponent can be pretty smart, even on easy mode. I never knew Patrick was such an expert on dots and boxes. 
The next one is called Cardboard, and it's a very interesting one. We start with dialogue between Spongebob and Patrick, giving the impression that this'll be a big game. Spongebob is bored, but Patrick makes a whole jungle based on his imagination, aka Cardboard. Now as Spongebob in Safari gear, you have to battle his cardboard monsters with your spatula. You try to retain your energy so you don't get tired while you fling Spongebob across the screen to slice up your enemies. Patrick's also back here looking all evil and stuff. If you fiddle with the mouse enough, you can pull off some really cool moves. Though it kinda sucks when you run out of energy and the enemies can just wail on you because you can't move out of the way. But this whole concept is really creative, as if all that cardboard was taken straight from imagination boxes. This is a cool way to spend your time. I like it. Another unique game is Make and Break. Okay, it's really unique. This one takes a new approach to the art of Flash gaming. It starts right away, so you may be confused at first, but it's easy to get the hang of. Either by using the on-screen buttons or the arrow keys, you try to construct robots by moving their different body parts across this conveyor belt. It's like a SpongeBob Tiger game. Or a Game & Watch game. It's creative, I'll give it that. Not the most detailed concept in existence, but I admire the work they put into it. So let's move on to a much bigger one. Like with Cardboard, this one also has dialogue in it. In Plankton's Paddy Plunder, we have comic panels for cutscenes, like in the sequels to Diner Dash and Obstacle Odyssey. So Plankton plans to sneak into the Krusty Krab's vents while Karen hacks the security system. Careful, Plankton, I think Truth or Square was going on in there. But to accomplish this goal, he rolls around in a protective infiltration sphere. Now just listen to this music. Now that's catchy. Plankton and Karen even talk during the stages, with Karen often giving you advice on how to use an obstacle. You have to utilize fans, and other devices, to blow Plankton through the stage and reach the exit. You avoid obstacles, cut chains, time things as best as you can, and yeah, you have to think and strategize to navigate Plankton through each of these stages. Timing is important, too. It's like the rolling ballroom from Battle for Bikini Bottom. I'm really sorry for reminding you all about that stage. But you can have a lot of fun getting all these contraptions to work right. Plus, Plankton and Karen have some humorous dialogue throughout it. Would recommend this one. But now for an equally large game. This next one is Marble Bash, which came out in September. It even had an article written about it. It's worth noting that in 2010, an app game called Marbles and Slides came out, which this game borrowed a few assets from. But this was still its own game, and has a lot to see. It strongly reminds me of the Wild Tangent games Word Symphony and Bounce Symphony. You don't get more nostalgic than that. There were also two different versions of this, but they weren't all that different. A bunch of marbles with Spongebob characters on them fall into the screen. They slowly fill it and rise to the top, but you have to draw a line to connect three to six matching marbles to make them disappear. You have to be quick, though. Power-ups can also fall in, such as rainbows that remove an entire type of marble, jellyfish that destroy surrounding ones, and bubbles that give you bonus points. If you click enough, you get a button that clears the entire board, but I sometimes don't notice it. And sometimes, a comet will fall down and destroy things for you, such as these rocks that you can't normally break. And don't click these skulls, either. They're bad. And what's with these eye icons? Icons, if you will. They follow your cursor as you move it. Ah yes, my favorite Spongebob character, the Wandering Eye. And if you aren't quick enough to clear a screen, this giant fist smashes down on everything. Your inability to match marbles has angered the gods. But this is great, and I like seeing all the different backdrops as you move through every stage. You might end up playing this for hours without realizing how much you've gotten into it. Relaxing music, too. Let's move into October, which will be when this video is posted, actually. Wow, it's rare that I cover holiday games in these videos that are actually appropriately seasonal. This is SpongeBob's Gone Missing. 
The Bikini Bottomites are having a party on the Flying Dutchman's haunted ship, but Patrick can't find SpongeBob anywhere. Now he has to go through each of the ship's levels to reach him. Every level is a series of platforms with ghostly enemies that attack you. There are fish in the background here, but they seem to entirely ignore them. Guess Patrick did something to really tick these spirits off. But you can fight them with your flashlight, even though they come back. Enter a code if you don't want to deal with that. And by the end of the first stage, you'll get a taste for the formula that will follow you throughout the game. You find Spongebob, but it turns out to be one of your other friends disguised as him. There are only eight stages, but they can go on for a bit, and it makes the game seem a little long. The stages aren't all that different either, but some can get pretty creative. I like how the different things around the ship can serve as their own unique platforms. But yeah, you'll figure out the formula really early on. Though everything switches up when you reach the Flying Dutchman himself at the top of the ship. Then you have a boss fight where he throws skulls at you. You shine your flashlight at him until he's defeated. Then big surprise, it's actually Spongebob. Your best friend tried to kill you as part of a prank, that's all. Then the real Flying Dutchman shows up and tells everyone to leave. So yeah, this game can be pretty fun. I like the art style, though all of the characters have disproportionate sizes or are giving emotions that aren't appropriate to the situation. So this game feels just a little uncanny. Not entirely sure why, but something does seem a little off about it. I guess that's what makes it an appropriate Halloween special. Very creepy. But now we're coming to the last four games of the year. None of these had credited developers, and they don't entirely look like one working man games either, but they were all amusing in their own ways, so let's check them out. First off, here are a few based on special episodes. Based on the big special, Spongebob You're Fired, Nick.com released a game by the same name. It's just another derivative of Flipper Flop, which Nickelodeon developers love to recreate around this time, but the art style is pretty cool. It's all papery. You just cook burgers on a grill and give customers the ingredients they ask for, and try to time everything as best as you can. Oh hey Squidward, glad to see you're embracing your love for Krabby Patties again. The other game based on a special episode was It's a Spongebob Christmas, even made in the style of that episode. All of the townsfolk are jerks, what else is new, and you have to turn them back to normal by singing. As we learned in the Spongebob movie, the power of music is enough to cure someone of any kind of mind-altering ailment. You click and hold the mouse button, then drag it over the jerks to sing at them. You can also grab falling presents for points, avoiding jerk tonium and coal. And you can even destroy these big robo Spongebobs. This is decent enough, nothing too complicated. I like how they were able to recreate the style from the episode though. A very nice adaptation. And now to close out, let's look at two other games without listed developers. This one is Lights Out, Patrick. Patrick is asleep and you can't wake him up, but you do have to complete a series of jumps to get up into the sky. I know, such a relatable situation. But nah, you're just in his dream. I don't know if he's actually dreaming about you or if you're just visiting, but you have to stay alive. You use the arrow keys to coordinate yourself and jump on the right platforms while avoiding obstacles. If you fall or take too much damage, Patrick wakes up. The screen is scrolling, so you have to be fast. That makes it hard to deal with these timed obstacles. And even Patrick in his sleepy state can appear in the dream. You ever have a dream where you're just sleeping in it? Very amusing. But if you jump on him, a bubble will carry you to a certain height. You can maneuver around, but make sure you stick the landing. Otherwise you just die. These pillows will also bounce you. Overall, I really like this one. Maneuvering through each obstacle is a lot of fun. I'd say this is a pretty good dream Patrick is having. Much better than the one where he loses his quarter. How sad. But to finish off, let's look at a much more simple one. This is Jellyfish Jumble. It starts off quietly, but then the music jump scares you. similar to Marble Bash, but with jellyfish this time. You have to connect jellyfish of the same color that are in close proximity to one another. You can also find power-ups that scare jellyfish away, reach ones that are far off, pause the timer, or get rid of all jellyfish of the same color. I love the Glove World backdrop too. And Spongebob sitting here in his glove toilet. Come on, that's totally what it looks like. The rainbow jellies can serve as any color, and the power-ups you collect are displayed at the side of the screen, which you can click to activate. You might like this one if you enjoyed Marble Bash. It's similar, but has its own original elements. It's alright. 
So that's going to do it for the games of 2013. We had some really big ones this year, and a lot of really interesting developments. Working Man really dominated, and they showed no sign of slowing down. Big games like Return to Monster Island and Marble Bash were a pleasure to play through, while ones like Super Easy Fun Time Adventure Pants gave us a humorous experience. The Nickelodeon Flash games were continuing to thrive, and the SpongeBob ones were right there at the top of them all. We still have a few years left to get through, so I hope you'll join us for the remainder of this web game adventure. Be sure to subscribe, follow me on Twitter and Twitch, which are linked in the description below, and tune in to our next installment. Thank you for joining me, I will see you in the next memory.